Number 10, the chimpanzee human, also referred to as human Zs, which is fun to say. Look, here are the facts, people. We are very close to chimpanzees, DNA-wise. Around 98% of our DNA is shared with these hairy fellows. Back in the 1920s, we got closer than ever. A human Z was not just a fantasy. Soviet biologist Ilya Avanov inseminated female chimps with human DNA, but it didn't work, or did it? Things got questionable when a chimp named Oliver hit the scene in the 70s. Yeah, he was walking like a a human, which we've never really seen before. He was referred to as the missing link because of his appearance and the way you would act. He was previously a performance animal. He was a show chimp, so not a hybrid, but many viewed these experiments as immoral back in the day, which is, yeah, I agree. Also, I remember seeing chimps in family movies, I'm pretty sure. Remember those movies growing up where chimpanzees were like snowboarding or playing hockey? Most extreme primate, that was it. That's where we're at, chimpanzees doing barrel rolls and hockey stops. My friends, we're already there. I think we're already at the Planet of the Apes terrifying point. We're screwed if one of these experiments works, that's all I'm saying. In our ninth spot, we had the human Z attempts. In 1967, scientists in China were working on creating a human chimp mix. Sadly, not much information about these experiments have been disclosed to the public. But rumor has it that the experiments didn't really work. They wanted to basically create a chimp that could talk fluently in whatever language it was taught. Then in 1981, they tried this experiment again. They impregnated a female chimpanzee with human sperm. Turns out, the chimp did manage to get pregnant by it, but sadly passed away three months later due to complications. Number eight, Kunga. Perhaps the earliest example of human-animal hybrid testing. Scientists recently learned about this donkey hybrid that roamed ancient Mesopotamia. This was a time even before horses arrived, so they had to do something. Large Kungas would pull wagons, and smaller ones would help pulling plows and smaller loads. These little guys were the talk of the town. Imagine a hybrid animal before horses. No wonder they were a status symbol back then. 4,000 years ago, they were given as gifts for weddings. Nice, yummy. Oh, I wonder what this one is. It's, it's definitely a kunga. It's gotta be a kunga. After so long, scientists are finally able to figure out what exactly a kunga was a hybrid of. It was a female donkey and a male Syrian wild ass. Yeah, it's crazy what you can still learn from ancient animal bones from thousands of years ago. Science is incredible. It's more amazing how involved this hybrid was in Mesopotamian culture. Do we bring back the kunga? I don't know. And it seems like we could use them. Number seven, woolly mammoth. It was announced less than a year ago that a team of scientists and entrepreneurs over at a new biosciences and genetics company called Colossal, they got the funding finally for quite this project. They're planning to bring the woolly mammoth back to life. Yep. Instead of just paying off student loans, they're like, how about we bring a mammoth back? Let's just see if we can do that. That'll solve some problems. The last mammoth alive was around 7,500 years ago. But what if we had these hairy goliaths back again today? The Siberian tundra thousands of years ago was once full of these guys, but climate change began to slow them down. Also, humans needing food definitely didn't help. These guys provided warmth and... Well, obviously, look at them. Lots of food, so they died off quite quick. Genetics company Colossal raised over $15 million to try and bring this thing back to life. And they're on the way, they're, they're doing it right now. That's happening as we speak. A mammoth is being born. They're using the CRISPR gene editing tool, which is a fun tool, I guess. Elephants are still kicking around and their genomes, combined with the preserved mammoth DNA, is the magic trick. So if you see mammoths trending on Twitter in four to six years, well, you know why. There's not another Ice Age movie. It's definitely just a real mammoth. Number six, Pyrenean ibex. The Pyrenean ibex also went extinct a long time ago. This was much sooner though than mammoths. This was around 2000. The last one was a female named Celia and a falling tree sadly ended her life. Of all the ways to go, really? Come on, man, that's sad. It was a subspecies of the Spanish ibex. They were native to the Pyrenees Mountains on the border of Spain and France. Back in the medieval ages, their population was reduced drastically to an endangered level because of, you know, knights and swords and bows equals lunch, right? So the numbers dipped. More than fair, this army's to feed, but in 2009, science was ready for the Pyrenean ibex to return. It was successfully cloned and brought back from extinction for seven whole minutes. Yeah, seven minutes in heaven, or seven minutes out of heaven, rather. DNA from the last living lady was implanted in the womb of a domestic goat. Yeah, a little goat, a little goat hybrid. Lung complications are why the clone sadly didn't last, but we had a hybrid medieval animal for seven minutes. We're getting close. Number five, the super cow. Moo, but with a lot of O's. Introducing the super cow. Okay, start your day off with some super milk, and then have a super stomach ache. <laughs> 
Get your super pants. My god, I can't do milk anymore. Only in Belgium. Back in the 1800s, scientists and farmers brought together native cattle and short horn cattles to make this hybrid animal. After that, they would literally just pick the biggest cows of the bunch and then have them breed together, and then so on and so forth. These cows are officially called Belgian blues, but I will continue to call them super cows. Thank you very much. That sounds amazing. I can't even look at them. God, they're disturbing. They look like bodybuilders. Just, it makes no sense. How does, what? Where does that come from? Let's move on. Number four, Tasmanian tiger. Once native to Australia, the Tasmanian tiger, also known as the thylakine, was a massive carnivorous marsupial that went extinct around the 1930s, also quite recently. Major factors here are as, you know, you guessed what I said earlier, climate change, hunting, and its genetic diversity wasn't all too great. All those combined, it's just no chance. It's sad on one hand because these beautiful creatures disappeared so recently, but it's also recent enough that we have a shot at bringing them back to life. Hey, what's up? Hey, you've been asleep, bye. Hybrid science. There we go. Let's get mixing. Yeah, imagine looking outside and seeing this thing on your front yard. Are we ready for this? I think we're ready. Let's jazz up some trails by introducing these guys. Specimens of the Tasmanian tiger still remain preserved in jars. No idea who has them or why, but we'll move on from that. Thank God for those jars. So we have Tasmanian tiger genes present, so scientists can now insert them into a mouse fetus. They just combine fetus of a mouse in DNA. I, I do this a lot, this is how I explain, I'm gonna explain this to my kids and be like, hey, this is how, how, how the human life cycle works. You just do this with your hands a lot and then you're alive. They're still lacking the full DNA to successfully recreate it, but they're close. A recent $5 million donation to the University of Melbourne earlier this year allowed for researchers to create a research lab. So yep, they're actually getting very close. They're like making the lab to make this thing. I'm like, ooh, they're gonna do it. Number three, the Great Razor Auk. Ah uh, yes, once thriving in colonies off North Atlantic coasts, the great auk would grow up to 30 inches long and its wings would only be used to swim. They were cute, but quite defenseless, these little guys. Around the 1500s, European fishermen discovered this perfect area for hunting and or eating, and it just happened to be where most of these great auks were hanging out, so they disappeared fast. By 1950, the last two known specimens were hunted by a single fisherman on Eldie Island, just off the coast of Iceland. And that was it. They were gone. Until now. Nice. Scientists plan on using genetic information extracted from their fossils, or preserved organs. Remember those guys in jars and the organs that I talked about? Yep. Classic organs in jars. Always coming in handy. They plan on editing their DNA into the closest living species, which is now the razor-billed ox. So now we get a Nice fun hybrid again. The organization Revive and Restore is behind the wheel on this one, so keep it up. Keep bringing things back from extinction. Just not humans, I don't want zombies, please. Number two, lions. Back in the 80s in the Chatbir Zoo in India, they started an experimental program where they would breed together domestic lions and African lions in the hopes that they would just be introduced to the wild and help with the dwindling population of wild lions in India. On paper, that's, yeah, that's a great idea. That's a step forward, we love those. But the zoo found two African lions that were being used in a circus and was like, you know what? We're gonna save you guys, get out of the circus. Then they brought them in to breed with their two Asiatic lions, so. I mean, from circus to science, it's like, eh, you're still sorry. When the cubs were born, it was clear this was already a mistake from the get-go. The cubs already had severely weak back legs, they were having trouble walking as they got older, their immune system started to fail, and by 2000, they had bred more than 70 of these hybrid lions. So they finally decided to stop the program and all the males were given vasectomies in order to stop any further reproduction. There are luckily laws that prohibited them from killing these animals, so at this point, we're just waiting for them to die naturally, which sucks, but it's definitely better. And finally, number one, the dodo bird. Dodo birds were once big and beautiful. These flightless ground nesting birds once filled the islands of Marudius located in the Indian Ocean. They were awesome. We've seen them in ice ages. They're all funny and big and furry. They had massive talons. They were gray and blue. They were gorgeous. And best part of all, they didn't have any natural predator until, you know, us, we, until we came around. Around 1507, the island was discovered by Portuguese sailors, and well, the rest is history, and or lunch. They were the easiest bird to hunt, hence the phrase dead as a dodo. They weren't just loved by sailors either, they were not 100% to blame here. Monkeys, rats, pigs, any animal basically that made its way to the island easily had their eggs for lunch, so it didn't take long for the dodo bird population to be completely wiped out. The last dodo was hunted in 1681, but could it be? Could we bring back said dodo birds? Scientists found an extremely well-preserved dodo skeleton back in 2007, so we may have a chance at picking some DNA apart there and bringing them back to life via hybrid science. A research facility near Melbourne, Australia is currently trying to use pigeon genes to bring the bird back. I mean, yeah, I'm all for the idea of bringing an animal back to life. Scientifically, that's definitely a feat in itself, but how long before these things are on hot ones, you know? Like dodo chicken wings? Now that I've said it, you kind of want one, right? Now you feel bad. 
There we go. Hit that thumbs up so we don't feel guilty in the future. Starting off this countdown, we have the Baboon Human. In October of 1984, Stephanie Faye Beauclair, otherwise known as Baby Faye, was born with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, meaning the left side of her heart did not grow properly. Sadly, no human heart donor could be found. So they decided to give her the heart of a baboon. In fact, she was the first infant who got a heart from an animal. And at this time, no infant had successfully received a heart transplant, even with a human heart. But it worked for baby Faye. Sadly, she lived for less than a month before passing away. Number nine, human cow eggs. Okay, we had a few giggles talking about chimps. Time to get into the real scary science. Back in 2008, hybrid research was being done. Human animal hybrid research, obviously. The whole idea was to find a cure for Parkinson's disease. I like these projects because we're moving forward, at least. We're not just doing it because we're like, eh, let's see if we can bring dinosaurs back. We're trying to find a solution. Otherwise, we don't need to be poking around cows. Nobody needs three bowls of cereal before gym class, okay? There's other ways to wake up in the morning. Let's just leave cows alone for like a bit, maybe? Scientists used the nucleus of a cow egg. They took it out and replaced that nucleus with the human and skin cells. And then in a little time, the egg can develop and turn into a blastocyst, aka a cloned embryo. And there we have stem cells for said science. Again, this is a lovely step, but how far do we go here with DNA mixing? How much DNA are we going to mix before we're like, stop? Things could go south. For example, just like the... In our eighth spot today, we have the mice with human brain. So, I know I just finished saying how the mice were killed if any human DNA was found in the brain, but... In 2005, a professor at Stanford University was given permission to create a mouse-human hybrid. He did so by transplanting human brain stem cells into the brains of mice. Now, the main goal of his experiment was to be able to study neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. Now, the first couple of rounds did not go so well. They found less than 1% of human cells in the rodent's brain. But by 2010, they found success. That's when they managed to, and I quote, use mouse stem cells to develop sensory hair cells, which could combat human hearing loss. They also managed to make the mice more human. As in the mice with the human brain cells were far more intelligent than the other mice. In our seventh spot, we have the human Z. Over the years, a number of scientists have run some wild tests on chimpanzees. Now, what makes these mammals of interest to them is because of how similar they are to humans. Humans and chimps share 98.8% of their DNA, hence why scientists are trying to make a chimp-human hybrid. Ilya Ivanov was the first person to attempt to create a human-chimp hybrid. Ilya continued these experiments until the 1920s. During that time, the Soviet Union was also running the same experiments. In 2019, rumor has it that a team of researchers from the Salk Institute for Biological Studies in the US successfully produced the first human monkey chimeras. So yeah, I don't really know how I feel about that. I don't know. In our six spots, we have the Kunga. In the early 2000s, when scientists unearthed the Kunga skeletons in northern Syria, they had no idea what they were looking at. The skeletons look like they belonged to horses, but they dated back to 2600 BC. And domestic horses wouldn't appear in the region for another 500 years, so they were a bit confused. Then they realized that this wasn't a horse, it was a human bred animal. In fact, this animal was a cross between a donkey and a wild ass. Apparently, back then, they were highly valuable and very expensive. Now, it's believed that these kungas were created for warfare, because not only could they pull wagons, but it was believed that they would be tougher. The thing with donkeys is that they would get scared easily, and they didn't need their donkeys running off mid-battle. But the wild asses, no one could tame them. So then they would breed them together and bam, it created an animal more desirable for them. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the human pig hybrid. The whole crossing humans with animal thing definitely creeps me out. But this one isn't what you think. They aren't creating a creature that is half human and half pig. Thank gosh, at least not yet. Instead, they are using the pigs to grow human organs inside of them instead of having patients wait for a donor. The first experiment was run in 2017, and an embryo was placed in an adult pig for four weeks. Then it was taken out to analyze, and the embryo survived and contained some human cells. Now they are going to figure out if pig embryos can handle enough human cells to create full human organs. 
However, a lot of people are against these experiments, saying that it is highly unethical. In our fourth spot, we have the dogs. A number of the dog breeds that you love have been severely crossbred. And when dog breeders get overcome by greed, they start to care more about money than they do about their dog's health. Take a look at this dog right here. This is a dog that suffers from short spine syndrome. You can see it has a squished body, huge jaw, and a really bad underbite. The dog was born from backyard breeding. The breeder was carelessly breeding a bunch of his dogs together. And this is the result, which is heartbreaking to see. And most of the time, these dogs are put down as no one wants to adopt them. Coming in at number three, we have the virus chimera. In 2017, Portuguese researchers decided to mess around with a mouse virus to create a chimera virus. Basically, a mouse virus with a human viral gene. Now, you're probably concerned like me, because I read this and I'm like, oh, they're trying to create another outbreak or something. But no, apparently this allows them to study viruses and how it impacts the rodent's body. But I will say that accidental outbreaks have occurred. In our second spot, we have the rabbit-human mix. In 2003, a team of scientists in Shanghai managed to fuse human cells with rabbit eggs. In the United States, scientists have been trying to do the same thing, but their attempts were always unsuccessful. Move over, American scientists, the one in Shanghai, be you to it. Now, this experiment was done to see if it can be used to grow cells or tissues for transplant patients. However, this experiment also had strict rules, and once the rabbit had human cells in its brain, it had to be destroyed. So they only let the human rabbit develop for a couple of days before they killed it and harvested it for stem cells. And in our number one spot today, we have the human demon sheep. Now, this is gonna keep you up at night for sure. In 2017, villagers in South Africa were horrified when a sheep gave birth to something that didn't look like a lamb, okay? In fact, it looked eerily human-like. As a result, people in the village were freaking out, saying that whatever was born was done by the works of the devil. In fact, rumor has it that this lamb was created from someone injecting the sheep with human sperm. Now, the lamb was still born, so it wasn't born alive. But still, how creepy is that? And many people in the village were convinced that beast and or witchcraft were behind this creature. Starting off this countdown, we have the rat pigs. The Salk Institute for Biological Studies in the US has been known to run a number of crossbreeding experiments. One was performed on rats and pigs. The team of scientists decided to take stem cells from rats and inject them into pig blastocysts. However, this failed. And I mean, I'm not surprised. Rats and pigs have different gestation times, and genetically, they are very different. But imagine a pig that looked like a rat. And our next hey, that is here we have the human mouse. Mice are constantly being experimented on in labs. This time, scientists in Japan tried to create a human mouse. Basically, they injected a mouse with human stem cells. They did this in an attempt to grow a human pancreas in the animal. But due to backlash, they have certain rules in place. At any point during the experiment, if the mouse is said to start developing a human-type brain, then it has to be killed and the experiments have to stop. Thank gosh, though, because uh, I'm not trying to have the world ruled by weird mutant human mice, no thank you. Coming in at number eight, we have the rat mouse. Scientists at the Salk Institute have found a way to grow the pancreatic tissue of a mouse inside of a rat. The mouse pancreas was able to grow inside of rats successfully. So they grew these new pancreases from mouse stem cells that were then placed in the bodies of the rats. And then when the pancreases were complete, they transplanted them back into the mice. Now the biggest thing about this experiment is that this technique could reverse diabetes in the mice. So they hope that one day they can grow organs inside the bodies of different animals and then you transplant those organs into humans to cure diabetes. Of course, there's still so much work to be done on this. The last thing they want is to grow a human organ inside of an animal and then have the recipient's body reject it. In our seventh spot, we have the killer bees. Did you know that killer bees were accidentally created by scientists? If they're out here creating bees that threaten the ecosystem, then who's to say they won't create animals that do the same? Basically, this all started in the 1950s. A biologist was commissioned by the Brazilian government to create a species 
species of bees that would increase honey production. But along the way, things went wrong. The biologist himself didn't have much experience with animal breeding. In the end, bees from southern Africa and local Brazilian honeybees mated and it produced these angry killer bees. And then of course, thousands of these bees just accidentally escaped. Now they get their name because when pissed off, they have been known to chase people down for more than a quarter mile. And on top of that, their stings are very painful. These bees are also aggressive towards other bees as well. So it puts them at risk and now we're kind of just stuck with them. In our six spots Today we have the human mouse. In the late 90s, three doctors started doing experiments to try and create human body parts in a lab. One of these experiments involves growing a human ear on the back of a mouse. So they did this by creating an ear shaped scaffolding and putting cells of cartilage from a cow on it. They then put the mouse under anesthetic and placed this ear under its skin. Crazily enough, the mouse's body fed the cow cartilage cells. The scaffolding dissolved and the mouse grew this artificial shape of a human ear, but it was only the outside of an ear. Okay, It didn't work, there was no eardrum. Now you might be wondering why they did this. Well, their hope is that this will help plastic surgeons when reconstructing human ears for their patients. So they would create this ear on the mouse and then graft it onto the person. So you'd have an ear that is part mouse, part cow. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the goat with human milk. I swear I didn't make this up, it's real and I'm a little disturbed. But basically, scientists have figured a way for goats to produce human breast milk. They did this by transferring human breast milk enzymes and proteins into goat embryos. In the end, they found that the milk the goats were producing wasn't 100% human, but it contained 60% of the lysosome and lactoferrin found in human milk. Now, why do they want goats producing human breast milk? Well, it could feed and save babies in need. Plus, it would have a longer shelf life. Would you try this milk? Let me know in the comments below. I've heard breast milk is pretty sweet, but I don't think I want to try it. Coming in at number four, we have the Belgian super cow. Now, you guys know how much I love cows. And if you didn't know, then hi, my name is Lindsay and I love cows. But this thing is terrifying. It's monstrous, okay? It's super ripped and it's just massive. The Belgian super cows were created back in the 1800s when Belgian scientists and farmers mixed native cattle with shorthorn cattle. Then over the time, they would select the biggest and strongest offsprings of each variety and then breed them together, so on and so on, bam! You got a super cow, which is definitely the biggest and strongest, and I understand why they call it the super cow. Like, just look at this beast, okay? It could crush anyone. In our third spot, we have the Enviro pig. So, pig waste is actually pretty toxic. I mean, if you've seen the Simpsons movie, then you'd know all about it. I mean, that was a bit of an exaggeration, but still. Anyways, pig's waste contains really high levels of phosphorus. This phosphorus ends up in lakes and rivers and oceans and can cause a boom of algae. So, scientists were trying to come up with a way for pigs to have less toxic waste, hence the creation of the Enviro pig. Enviro pigs are pigs with up to 65% less phosphorus in their excretements. This pig was first created in 1999 at the University of Guelph's farm in Canada. This pig had its phytase gene attached to a piece of mouse DNA. Now it's really complicated to explain, but here's an explanation, and I quote, the genetically altered pig was created using genetic material from a mouse and an E. coli bacterium to reduce phosphorus in the pig's feces. In the end, it made the pig excrete fewer pollutants. Moving on to number two, we have the pig with human blood. Now you're probably noticing a trend by now. Pigs and mice are the scientists' test subjects of choice. Researchers at Mayo Clinic in Minnesota have managed to create pigs made out of human blood. So the pigs have human blood pumping through their veins. Not only that, but some of the cells in the blood merge together to create pig-human cell hybrids. Now, the reason behind this all is to allow scientists to study how viral infections can transfer from animals to humans. And in our number one spot today, we have Oliver the Chimp. In the 1970s, there was a performing chimpanzee that received a lot of attention. His name was Oliver. Now, Oliver was really different from other chimps for a number of reasons. The main being that Oliver might have been a successful mix between a human and a chimp. 
Yeah, you heard me. A lot of doctors and scientists are convinced that Oliver was a human Z. It's believed that they inseminated a female chimp with male sperm and Oliver was the offspring. Now let's take a look at the facts. Oliver didn't look like other chimps. In fact, he had a more human-like appearance. He had a flatter face than other chimpanzees. And he walked on two feet instead of all fours. He also preferred human females over female chimpanzees. And he understood humans very well. So could it be that Oliver was actually half human, half chimp, 